It is the duty of the free man to resist tyranny at every turn. Every man will either watch his freedom stripped away or take action to protect what he loves. Introducing the A3, the newest revolutionary body armor from Armored Republic. The A3 is the new standard for lightweight multi-hit body armor. A3 plates are incredibly light at 4.6 pounds. The patented design captures fragmentation while remaining multi-hit capable. The A3 will stop up to M80 ball, yet comes in at only 0.7 inches thick. The A3 is the thinnest NIJ.06 compliant or certified composite standalone plate that includes the drop test. The A3 is the first of its kind, patent pending, that combines an alloy strike face with polyethylene backing, revolutionizing body armor technology by providing strength and durability while remaining sleek and maneuverable. The A3 is the new standard in lightweight body armor. The fight against tyranny just got stronger. Looking for a job isn't easy. It used to be that you could apply at a big name tech company and build a great career for yourself. But times have changed. Many of these companies have gone full woke. And if you aren't the right gender, ethnicity, you don't use pronouns, or if you're not an activist for the preferred cause, then good luck. Why would you risk your career on that? At Red Balloon, we're connecting good employees with top quality companies that value you for your skills and your work ethic, not your social activism score. Employers who post jobs on Red Balloon are focused on creating an enjoyable and productive work culture, free from divisive woke mandates. So if you want to find a serious career path without the nonsense, come to Red Balloon and post your resume today. Because you shouldn't have to choose between your job and your values. That's redballoon.work where you can find your future. Hey y'all, welcome to Cross Politics on the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network. Pastor Toby Chuck Knox, I'm the water boy, it's good to be with you. We also have um, our now canceled friend in the PCA. <laughs> wait, not Zach. yet. We, we don't know that yet. <laughs> oh, we don't know that we yet? Don't, we gotta wait till the end okay. of the show to get that I, kind of information. Soon to be canceled. I, I have a feeling. So you do know, I guess. Okay, never mind, my bad. Pastor Zach Garris from uh, New Mexico, um, uh, just outside of Los Alamos. Um, and for our listeners, I went to a Presbyterian Church in Albuquerque, New Mexico. One time? For, for one year. For a whole year. Oh, uh, we, year. We moved, my dad moved there oh. to work at Intel um, back in the day. And then we moved back to Texas and I went back to our old I Presbyterian Church. I knew you were church, waiting yeah. for some reason to bring this. Um, sorry about Texas. So, right uh, yeah. uh, so we, went, we were there for in New Mexico for one year and went right back to Texas. We're like, <laughs> screw New Mexico. I knew This is horrible. So, game, so, game, game, game. We're right, okay. right in front right. of him. Don't say that. Hey, Come, right. We're in the wet, uh, best part of New Mexico. It's true. Uh, so no, it's true. The most Texas-like part of The least Texas part. It's beautiful. It's beautiful where he's at. Mountains. Hey, let me just remind you guys – Grace Agenda 2023 is here in Moscow, Idaho in August. And full. Um, is it, it? I mean, I don't know if it's totally sold out, but I mean, it's. You guys, well, you that's just, what full means. Well, you keep, putting, you keep putting the ad in yeah. here for me to read. I'm, just, tell, I'm just trying to tell our listeners, if you're going to come, you better sign up now because it, like, yeah. it's probably got a week left. That's all. So it's not full. So it's not full yet. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so don't listen to games. Anyways, <laughs> uh, Christian parents have an amazing task of raising their children to love and worship the Lord Jesus to lead uh, their generation uh, to be the sort of faithful saints that can do the same for their own children after them. So uh, you want to sign up now. Registration is almost full. That's what it says, almost full. Okay. Right? So Gabe's wrong. Fair enough. But it's probably <laughs> going to be full very soon. Go to graceagenda.com today and register. Uh, the theme this year is good education in the badlands. Mm -hmm. And if you can't make the conference in person, all the talks will be posted to YouTube. And we encourage you to consider donating to the conference if you want to support this kind of thing at graceagenda.com slash donate message. And, um, Oh, you got it to work. Yeah, I'm working over here. Uh, what have you guys done to my equipment? Uh, uh, well, I leave and everything goes. You were, yeah. you were gone for a week, so it's yeah. all your fault. Hey, we're really grateful to have Pastor Zach Garris uh, in the studio with us. He's pastor at Bryce Avenue Presbyterian Church in the PCA in White Rock, mm -hmm. New Mexico. Uh, he's a graduate of uh, Reformed Theological Seminary, and also he's also a he's a lawyer, you guys. 
He's no like, way. I knew there was something about you no that way. was like yeah. a little. You know, he's talking about words. <laughs> yeah, he was like, he's like you it depends on how you say about it. How you say Wait, things. I'm yeah, sorry, and I was like, no, out. you don't. Time out. <laughs> Were you a lawyer and then you became a pastor? Were you a pastor and then became a lawyer? Yeah, actually, I uh, I became a lawyer first. But I, I had gone to seminary before, so but you were so I, I knew better. Yeah. So okay, Whew. so I went to <laughs> Wayne State University for law school. He's also the author of this book right here, "Masculine Christianity." Keep your fingers off it. Don't touch I, it. I see. Don't it. touch I, it. Yeah, I didn't get a copy. Um, Are you done? Do you have a you have you have a wife and kids? Yes, it's not in your bio. I mean, oh, I, mean, I uh, shorted it down. I, 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 yeah. how, how many kids? Uh, second on the way. Second okay, son. and, and yeah. so since you're Presbyterian, they all they, 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 uh, they're bad. Okay, yeah. yeah. <laughs> just, one, just, just one to make sure. I, I take uh, your kids if you have yeah. children. Yeah. Yeah. I take one. a vow to the uh, Westminster Standard, so yeah. I, I have to baptize my baby. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're a yeah. Christian. Yeah. So you <laughs> you're Christian. Your baby. <laughs> <laughs> you also understand that Abrahamic covenant. Yeah. And you're like, so, all right. Yeah, Anyways, cool. um, so Zach, um, what what made you write this book? I mean, don't we have? I mean, isn't masculinity toxic? Kind of toxic. I mean, I mean, don't we have? Enough John Wayne Christianity to go around. And Dabney's. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> why? Why masculine Christianity? I don't remember when it came out, but it's been, uh, a, been a few years. Yeah, but. Uh, let's see, 2020. Yeah, the, um, yeah first I mean, came out. So I mean, I, clearly, I mean, during COVID, I mean, we had a we had plenty of masculinity to go around. Go around. Yes, yeah, I mean, so much. I mean, why? Why? I mean, isn't this like you know pulling out the you know fire extinguishers when you have a flood? Yeah, I. I mean, part of this was uh, I think. Uh, just a response to egalitarianism in the church. Yeah. I, 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 I'm trying to respond to a lot of the egalitarian arguments, feminist arguments with scripture, which you see a ton of in commentaries nowadays. Obviously, we have tons of books that are, uh, I think, undermining uh, biblical teaching on these things. So I, I tried to write a comprehensive book on gender roles, really. Uh, on man, mm. What does it mean to be man and woman, God's design for men and women? Mm-hmm. It's, you know, going to Genesis, uh, the creation account, and then, you know, throughout the scriptures. So, it, it, yeah, it's meant to be a comprehensive uh, book on on the subject. Since, since it seems like the whole culture has absolutely mm-hmm. gone insane, uh, what what exactly is a man? <laughs> <laughs> just, just curious. <laughs> well, if I have to define it for you, you're, you're in trouble, I think. But um, Well, we're in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> we're in, we're we, in have trouble. You, have you turned on the news lately? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're in trouble. We have no idea. Uh, I mean, obviously, uh, 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 a man, I mean, I argue in the book, as far as masculinity goes, you know, God's design for men and women, um, you know, differs, uh, but uh, uh, which is rooted in the creation account. So, so God has designed men to exercise authority. I mean, obviously, there's the biological differences. That should be obvious. But, right. but that these things are supposed to play out differently in how we live. So, a, you know, a man is supposed to uh, protect and provide. Those are kind of the main um, duties he's placed on men, you know, especially in relation to the, the family, their w- wife and uh, children. And, and then, um, you know, I argue a wife is supposed to be uh, domestically oriented. So, uh, having children, caring for them and in and, and the home and the like. So, but Zach, I mean, you're in the PCA and like in the PCA, like everyone there understands male, female roles, right? They should. Uh, I I think there's, you know, this goes for all of kind of uh, conservative, what, what we call conservative, you know, evangelicalism or Protestantism, whatever you want to say. I mean, there's just a ton of uh, feminist influences. I mean, that's just that's just the, the the way it is. And I think some of that just come from over the years, uh, strain from maybe the biblical teaching, and then the of course we have the culture, you know, influencing the church, and so. Uh, th- there's definitely disagreement within the PCA on on some of these things. Um, I'm sure not everybody likes my book. So. You know, I grew up in the PCA in the 80s and 90s, and I couldn't imagine some of the debates the PCA is having now. Um, you know, with uh, side B sexuality, Greg Johnson, um, women pastors. Apparently, there's a debate uh, about women pastors now in, in well, the PCA. Well, I, I haven't seen anyone arguing for women pastors, but I, I have seen. Um, I mean women preaching. We have that right now, Covenant College, which is a, uh, a PCA yep. institution. My brother went there for six months yeah, and, it's, and left. Uh, I mean, there's... Uh, wait, there's, wait, 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 wait. Women preaching at Covenant College. At their chapel service. You, you can go YouTube it. It's Yeah, I mean, it's it's obvious. It's right there. I, I don't know how many people know it's happening, but it's it's definitely... What, what, so have you asked? Have you, have you asked about it? What, 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 I mean, what are they saying? Is anybody... 
saying anything about it? Well, I've it's come up some, you know, among some pastors, maybe some online forums. I mean, some guys defend this stuff. They're saying, "What's well, it? It's a chapel service. It's not a." Um, I guess because it's not Sunday morning. I mean, I say it's look. It's a public worship assembly. It doesn't matter that they're not serving the Lord's Supper. Right. It it still is a violation of First Timothy two. Right. And I think that's. I, I don't know how you get there, honestly. So wow. So so that so that's the defense. The defense though is this is a chapel service. This isn't a the church service. That's one defense. Okay. I I don't know. I haven't heard a lot of commentary on it. <clears throat> So, and you told us before the show that your church has actually offered a an overture to uh, to General Assembly. Is that, is that where it is? Yeah, that's right. So so we uh, we drafted an overture that essentially bans women preaching, teaching, or exhorting in a public worship assembly, and then uh, it adds some language about basically any any uh, public assembly where where men are present, which would include chapel services. Hmm. So. It's it's supposed to be pretty narrow in right. the sense of uh, uh, just applying to a, a formal public worship assembly. I think right. I think the language is pretty clear, but so it, it would it would address something like what's happening at Covenant College. But your presbytery didn't didn't endorse it. No, they they uh, they rejected it for they gave some different reasons. Um, I mean, when you some, say when you say presbytery, you mean like men? Yes. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> like, like like elders, elders. and pastors. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, yeah, yeah, so yeah. Ru- uh, ruling elders and teaching elders. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, so like they, after they Titus it. and Timothy. And you, okay, just making sure. I just, <laughs> just trying to figure that part out. Doc's been out of studio for something yeah, that needs to be I, brought up to I, speed. But, but <laughs> even though they rejected it, it's still able to go up to the general assembly. Yeah, it's this kind of funny thing about the PCA polity. Uh, but yeah, the the rules allow us to send a rejected overture. Yeah. We can't change it, but the church itself, the session, can, can vote, vote to, to send, send it. it up. So then it goes to the overtures committee uh, for the general assembly, and then they can send it. They can modify it. They can send it before the assembly to vote on it, which is in June, or so, or not, or not. But okay. I'm hoping they do. Yeah. Do, do, I'm sorry, Pastor. What were you gonna say? Well, I was just gonna ask what were the reasons that your presbytery gave for. Did they give you any down? reasons? Yeah, yeah, they gave some. They gave a variety of reasons. Um, you know, some guys argued it was unclear. I mean, th- <laughs> this is, of course. This is pretty typical for what we hear, even with things like the wow. the overtures on homosexual identity right, or yeah. description. Um, so you hear kind of similar arguments, which, I mean, obviously I'm arguing in favor of these overtures. I think we need to say something. We should say it the best we can. Um, but, you know, that was rejected again, too. The, the There was another overture this year on um, – Homosexual. Well, last year was homosexual right. identity. This right. one was if someone describes an officer describes himself as a homosexual. Yep. Now, so both of those the last two years passed the general assembly, but they failed at the presbytery level. They were only right. getting you yeah. need two thirds of the presbyteries. They were getting over sixty percent, but not enough. Yeah. yeah. But there's there's a whole slate of overtures yeah. related to this uh, again this year. So this is not over in the PCA. Would they say the same thing about you know? First Timothy chapter two, it's just unclear. <laughs> well, you know, it seems look, like okay, if you can make that, the, that's the Bible. If you can make that argument here, here. Let, well, let, let me say this: just, I mean, who's who's one of the more prominent guys in the PCA would be Tim Keller, right? Yeah. Um, he, he's he's spoken to this some, but his his wife has a whole booklet out there uh, called Jesus, uh, Justice and Gender Roles. Have you guys read that? Is she a teaching elder? She's not, <laughs> okay. but um, but you can go read this. So this this tells you, I. I think is Tim's view. She basically says this is the view at uh, Redeemer, right. which he's he's retired now. But right. and, and so they they promote that whole um, phrase: a, a woman may do anything a non ordained man may do. And so I, I address that in the book here, of course. So th- that's one view. And so she actually even argues in that booklet that Paul in First Timothy two, which just so, so uh, listeners know what he says, it's I, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Right. Uh, Kathy Keller says that Paul is only prohibiting an authoritative teaching. So she combines those. That's actually an egalitarian argument. That's something Philip Payne does in his writings. He's egalitarian. Yeah. So that's what she says Paul's prohibiting. So only teaching that it's authoritative. Authoritative teaching. So that actually would allow. I don't. I don't think she pushes it in there, but that would allow a, a woman to preach yeah. in a public worship assembly. Yeah. If you take that view, so and I think that's wrong because the argument would be I'm I'm teaching in an unauthoritative way. Or, or under it's under the authority of the elders. Oh, I see. I mean, you, you okay. probably heard that, right? And sure. So this is one thing I address in the book: is is we're seeing a very 
narrow complementarianism today. Right. You, I was going to ask you, yeah, your, yeah. your chapters, you have a chapter in there on like complementarian compromises. Yeah. What, I mean, what do you mean by that? Well, what I, what I mean is complementarianism as a movement, which was basically starting in the late 80s and then in the 90s. Um, <clears throat> and you still have it around today. You have the Council of Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. And then you have the the book that Piper and Grudem edited, yeah. right, um, Recovering from Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. Um, or rec- sorry, that's the Amy Bird <laughs> that was, book. Yeah, that's what <laughs> oh, that was. Oh, recovery. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's just a, recovering it's from confusion. Recovering. So it's recovery. It's supposed to be Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> And in, in, in the, the the Piper and Grudem book, I think, is overall pretty good. But uh, there's some things I would disagree with in there. But they were responding to evangelical feminism. Right. And and so I think, I think, in, and they were also trying to, res- they were trying to do something new. I mean, and that was clear, the term, right? Right. Complementarian. I mean, sometimes in the early writings, they would use the word traditionalist. Um but it became clear they were trying to separate themselves from the earlier reformers. Yeah, headship and, and submission. Yeah, 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 but but they didn't want to be called traditionalists or I, I, they definitely moved away from uh, the earlier reformed interpretation of First Corinthians fourteen thirty four and thirty five, which where the, it says the the women should be silent in the churches. Right. So so there was a new interpretation of that, um, but I think they also really they started to uh, maybe detach some of the co- commands or teaching on um, male headship and, and uh, that women shouldn't be pastors. They detached these some from, you know, God's design of men and women. And so it was like just this really, like just going off the command and, and not rooting it like Paul does, like in creation. Right. And so that allows them to, I guess sometimes you see it was like they don't really know why God made right. it this way. Right. <laughs> and it, and then it just really opened the door, I think, for some very narrow views. And, uh, you know, today, complementarianism is very diverse. If somebody says they're a complementarian, yep. I have to ask them what they mean by that because right. I like don't know. Like a covenant college. Yeah, right, <laughs> right. right. So, so yeah, I mean, somebody if somebody's calling themselves a complementarian and thinks a woman can preach to men, I, yeah. but I don't, you know, they don't hold the women pastors. I mean, that's just... I mean, we've moved so far I think, from... I think the word you're looking for is lame. Well, yeah, it's definitely <laughs> lame. Yeah. You know, it seems to me like complementarianism, when it when um it started to really gain traction in, I would say, the 2000s, late 2000s. Is that, would that be fair to say? Complementarianism? I, or, I mean, it was earlier than that. I mean, the 90s. I mean, it came yeah. around in the 90s, but yeah, it, right, but it, it definitely really grew in Grew in big time. Because I remember Mark Driscoll started saying he's complementarian. Yeah. Um, uh, Chandler, Matt Chandler uh, yeah. started saying they're complementarian. And it always seemed to me like it was a backdoor way that was going to get back to feminism. Well, that, was, that's where it's gone. I don't. Yeah. I don't think that's what they necessarily intended. I don't no. think Mark did but, at all. Um, right. But it was like happened. it's like when when I remember when that terminology really started picking up steam. I was like, yeah, of course, I think my wife compliments me, or you know. Yeah. Completes me or and, whatever, you know, whatever. And men and you know, she women helps me. Are complimentary and, 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 right, in, the, you know, in the church and in the society. Like, I don't have a problem with that, but like, why not use headship and submission and, you know, like Christ in the church, you know, like the, like yeah. what Ephesians 5 says. I don't find complementarianism in those, uh, with that terminology in the Bible. And, and I think that's been caused a lot of problems in the church because they were, it's almost like they're reacting to feminism, trying to find a better way to basically couch biblical marriage to a society that didn't use headship and submission. But was re- responding to feminism, right? And but, and now, I, well, yeah, it's it's more palatable. It's a yeah. little more winsome. It's yeah. a little more nice sounding because yeah. you know, third third wayism. Yeah, right. Uh, right. Yeah, yeah. I, so, I, I that's think right. That's right. So, Pastor, help me understand. You said that the argumentation that people are using right now is a woman can do anything an unordained man can do, and you said you argue about that in your book. You make a distinction. Could you just give us a sample of how you speak against that? <clears throat> yeah. So, I, I've seen j- just to say who's. Um, Using that, uh, I at least know Tim Keller does, and uh, John Frame. I've seen a lot of people so, in the SBC use it as well. Yeah, um, I, I think there's at least two problems with it. Um, the The first is they may be allowing non ordained men to do too much in a, a worship service. So, so <laughs> yeah. there's there's a problem there. Um, so you know, areas where this apply would be uh, reading scripture. In, in public worship, leading prayers. And you'd be surprised. There's a lot of, you know, guys who would call themselves conservatives and they're, they're having women lead prayer up front. Um, well, I, I mean, I, tons of them have them lead prayer when it's set to music. Yeah. 
But that's another issue. Pe- pe- um, pe- I think people, I mean, literally, I mean, I think people are idiots. Like, seriously. What Bible verse is that? It, it, it's, it's, in, it's the whole book of Proverbs. Yeah. Like, the, the, I mean, well said. fool, yeah. idiot. Yeah. Yes, okay? Sir. Yes, sir. Um, it's like, I don't think women should lead in prayer. But if you put it to music, have six of them up there. <laughs> like, no, you'd have women leading you. I mean, some of the most conservative people do that. Yeah, yeah, I've seen yeah. that. Why is so? One. Of Sorry, the, I interrupted you. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, okay, so, so so that's, that's just me. That's not Pastor Zach. I, that's just me. And for Proverbs. <laughs> and, and, but, but, and Proverbs. And Proverbs and Paul and Jesus. Okay. I, <laughs> I think the whole worship service should be led only by ordained males, so that would be ruling elders and teaching elders, and uh, licentiates, so that so maybe men training for the the ministry. So this should be a limited thing. Um, so that I know it's, you know, a pretty conservative position, but I think that's traditionally what, you know, the reformed held. And, uh, so, so, so in other words, a non-ordained man shouldn't be up there, um, leading a lot of these things in the first place. So that's part of the problem with that phrase. But the other thing is there are passages that explicitly for, uh, prohibit women in particular from doing things. And that's first Timothy two, first Corinthians 14. So they, you know, they, they say that the women, I mean, 1 Corinthians 14, if you adopt the traditional position, is that uh, women should not speak publicly in the worship service. Right. So they, they shouldn't lead anything up front. And then 1 Timothy 2 is, it's, again, it's targeting women. It, there's nothing directed at men in general. I, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Right. So that, even if you uh, had a looser view of non-ordained man, men in the public worship service, you have these two passages targeting women. It's placing prohibitions on women. So, yeah, that uh, that view's just, it doesn't make sense of the Bible. So you you were arguing earlier that this is rooted in creation. Can you, because a lot of times I think in these conversations, what the left or the people who are uh, not nearly as conservative, as they're making arguments, they make them so that they're emotionally felt. It seems wrong right. to... Withhold a woman from being. This is from exercising get, her You gifts. guys had the show with Rick Warren. Rick yeah. Warren was talking yeah. about this. It's like women preach the gospel. They proclaim the gospel out there. When Jesus was risen from the dead, they went and proclaimed it. You know, the, um, they have duties where they tell other and disciple people. And so we do a good job of saying, yeah, that's not right. But what does a, a positive version of that look like? Why are we doing it so that it's men? What is the argument for the proper way of doing it? And what is the impact of that versus the other side? Yeah. So that's one thing I try to argue in the book is that uh, these commands in Scripture for m- men to rule in the church, and so, so pr- you know, to limit preaching to men, that's rooted in God's design in creation. So for like Adam, for example, you see um, he, he's told in Genesis 2.15 to work and keep the garden. So he's got this task to um, work, which I tie with providing for his family, and then um, keeping is, is another way to translate it as guarding. So right. he's, a, he's a protector. Right. And so um, that, of course, applies to the family. You know, man, man as the head of his household, he's to protect and provide his household. But I also apply that to the church, that some men are called to be elders. And what do they do? They protect and provide. So they uh, are they're, to— they're shepherds. Yeah, they're shepherds. So what does a shepherd do? He defends the sheep. Right. So protect uh, from, from false teaching. But that's uh, 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 says an elder is to be able to um, rebuke those who contradict uh, sound teaching. So that's, that's certainly the protection aspect. And then, um, uh, but I would also say the provision aspect, they're, they're supposed to teach the word of God, right? So uh, they're supposed to guard these things. That's entrusted to not all men, but some men. Uh, that God has gifted and called and ordained in the church. And so I, I think we see that connection even in the creation account. It's not just 1 Timothy 2 and 1 Corinthians 14. It's the whole Bible. It all works together, and it, it forms a cohesive whole. It's, it's, I, I want to go back to something you mentioned earlier, that um, it, you know the whole idea of, I think, one of the weaknesses of complementarianism, and, and you see this even in really well-meaning conservative places, is that— they are holding on to what it says in Ephesians 5 or 1 Timothy 2 still, and they, and they say it, but they have no idea why. And, and, I, and I think, you know, obviously I prefer somebody to try to obey not understanding than just throw it out the window. Right. But I do think that's a setup for over time 
you don't understand why, you don't understand why, you don't understand why. And then you start looking for the explanation. Maybe I misunderstood the command. Uh -huh. And then you read an egalitarian or a feminist who says, actually, the Greek can be understood this way, even though it takes a little bit of gymnastics and origami, but we can get it out there, you know, and you say, oh, well, that makes more sense because the other one never made any sense to me. Right. And, and, be, and then the emotional appeal. That's right. Um, comes in. and But I think you're absolutely right, going back to 1 Timothy 2 in particular, for the man was made first, and the woman was deceived, not the man. Mm -hmm. I mean, those are not popular verses, yeah. um, but that's that's rooted in that's Genesis, Genesis 2 and 3 gives you the reasons why a, a, a woman is not to teach or have authority over men in the church. Yeah, and I, I think part of the problem here is I mean, because of our culture, a lot of even Christians, pastors as well, are uh, assuming a lot of egalitarian philosophical principles. So mm -hmm. that's the, the, they're coming at the text as egalitarians. And, of course, if you believe the Bible and you read like First Timothy 2, you're like, well, I have to fit this in somehow. Uh, Paul prohibits women from doing something. and But th they're inclined towards taking the most narrow view yeah. Minimalist. And like you said, yeah. so they don't have a basis. So, you know, I think it's pretty common. A pastor, if he's going through Ephesians, which, you know, a lot of pastors do, get to Ephesians 5, and then you're going to, you know, tiptoe around it. Oh, wives, submit to your husband. Well, let me focus on husbands yeah. love your wives. Mutual which, submission. It's both, right? Or, it's, yeah, or, or mutual yeah. submission. But yeah. it's, right? I mean, Paul, Paul addresses both, yeah. uh, men it just and women. It means the man is the tiebreaker. Uh, yeah, you hear, uh, 51. You, you hear that too, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, you know... Uh, this idea that in marriage, uh, authority only comes into play when there's a disagreement. So, yeah. it, so. It, it, it seems, yeah, but, which is not, I mean, how, yeah. Like that's not leadership. No, like right, just right. just to be really clear, like that's not yeah. leadership. Is to be like if you're breaking the th the disagreement. Yeah, like, so yeah. like <laughs> when the Holy Spirit and Jesus are arguing, basically you're the father gets to say, "All right, guys, I'm gonna." No, that doesn't work that way, <laughs> right? That's not how the Godhead models itself, right? Right. right. So, if if um, you got a question? No, I do. Hey, so there's, I think the reason that there's a couple things, and I'll try and get to my question quickly. I think when we gave up the, on slavery because we didn't know how to argue for it biblically and argue what it was biblically and chattel slavery influenced our interpretation of scripture, we gave up one of the things in Ephesians that the Bible talks about. <laughs> and so we started eroding. Which from, is? Which is the fact that there is a, a form of biblical slavery, indentured servitude, that lasts for six, seven years. Right. And it's a form of blessing one who does not have the means to be blessed, to come in under your house, under your authority, to train, teach, disciple, mm -hmm. and then to send them off with wealth over that period of time, right? We've forgotten about that, and we let the world influence a chattel form of slavery into the idea of biblical slavery. Husbands love your wives. Children obey your parents. Um, oh, first, husbands obey Christ. Uh, yeah. Wives submit to your husbands. Husbands love your wives, right? Um, and then after children obey your parents, it's slaves obey your masters, right? And then it says masters Remember, you have a master in heaven. Mm -hmm. So it sets up a form of hierarchy, and we don't have any concept of that because we've blown up one of them. And it's a form, it's a horrible form of um, of logic. It's like, well, since we've blown up this last one, I guess we got to blow up the rest of them. And that's kind of what happened. There, there definitely is a connection between what I would call abolitionism, like the abolitionist mindset from the 1800s, you yep. know, um, related to the, the Civil War. And if you take that logic, which I think you, you could want to get rid of slavery, but it's the— it's, I'm talking about the view that says slavery is always wrong, mm -hmm. right? Like that there's no the Bible doesn't allow any form of slavery. We well, that's slavery wrong. Now. I mean, the right. Bible, the Bible, obviously, right? <laughs> you read yeah. Ephesians, like you said, what, well, slave, there, there was a book called Philemon, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. So, so that if you take that f philosophy, um, which I think is an egalitarian form of egalitarianism, yep. and you go with that consistently, you're going to overturn, and that's what they do. They overturn male headship. The reason I was bringing that up was because. This actually has implications not just for the offices of elder and deacon and so on and so forth. This has implications all the way out to politics, society, and jobs in society. And that's why I think part of the fight is here is because if you get – however you view those offices starts to tell you what kind of jobs women can have in society. And right now we're like, well, women can do whatever they want to do in society. They can be police officers. They can be in the military. They can be drafted and they can go fight. The reason we're having that kind of argument is because the cult of the society, Christianity, has forgotten the hierarchical structure and the metaphysics of that structure. What is a woman and what is she for? Right. And, and so when we start looking at 
this text, we're saying, hey, now if this has changed and whatever, a woman can do whatever she wants to in society, she can hold public office. Well, no, <laughs> right? No, she can't. She's not designed for that. It's not what she's for. And so there's things that I think that we're getting at inside of the text that's causing corruption downstream of, of that. Well, <clears throat> one thing I argue in the book there, and, and this is somewhere a lot of complementarians don't want to go, is I do think it's logically consistent to argue out from the home. So if a husband right. is supposed to lead his household, I mean, that's also one reason why only men are to lead in the church. It also follows that um, only men should lead in the civil sphere. If we're talking like offices, like— These uh, are governments. Yeah, government officials, mm -hmm. uh, go like a governor or a president, um, that should be limited to to men. That's God's design for men. Now, if you get into uh, the reformers on this, there, there was some debate between like Knox and Calvin where Knox actually argued uh, that— that the, women rulers were the monstrous in, regiment invalid. of women. Yeah, uh, yeah. it's like Knox. Illegitimate. You should write the part two. Uh, uh, <laughs> the return <laughs> of the monstrous what? regiment of women. <laughs> yeah, I, I'd There's buy a Monty Python <laughs> skin there somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> so, Note taken. So that's that's Knox's view is that it's illegitimate. Of course, that got him into trouble once uh, Bloody Mary died. Yeah. Um, and you had Elizabeth come in there, but. Calvin, and, and, and it seems the view of the other re reformers, was, well, it's not illegitimate for a woman to rule, but it certainly is not normative, right? right? And it shouldn't be the norm right. that women are are having to lead in, having to or trying to lead in public office. Of course, we have today where th that's the norm. We, you know, if you don't have an equal number of yeah. men and women, and women yeah, yeah. you know, leading these positions. But th here's the thing. This actually goes back to first wave feminism. And I, I have some quotes in there. Um, I think it was Anna Howard Shaw. She was a... a she was actually a Methodist minister for a time. Uh, so you had some... <laughs> that was your first clue. Yes, yeah, so you had some, some pastors <laughs> way back then. But a leader in the uh, women's rights movement, which is first wave feminism. And, and she even has a quote in there about wanting to be a politician. She didn't think it would happen at the time, but she says, I confess to wanting to be a politician and then wanting to be a police officer. Right. So this stuff was all in the 1800s. It right. didn't come out of nowhere in the, right. in the 60s and 70s. This right. is not new. Right. The seeds were planted 150 years ago. And you can see the connections. And so basically, that's where we've been going for a long time. And I agree. It's it's this undermining of uh, just just even the biology. Uh, right. Obviously, you can just look at a man and a woman, and a woman's body is not designed for that kind of role. That is just right. something a man is supposed to do. Yeah, when, I mentioned this just, just as an example. I mentioned this on the show before, but I saw the new Top Gun Maverick, you know. Have you seen this? The new Top Gun. He's, he, uh, he's, I haven't. Okay, he's he's holier than that. Yeah, he he's uh, obviously. <laughs> uh, anyways, I mean, it's it's a fun flick. All all all, um, all things being equal, but there is this this you know part of the the show is this. They've got to take this one particular flight in, and they describe, um, you know, how in, a normal person, a normal man, will like in order to do this certain number of G's, you will black out. Uh -huh. Like the only qu the question is is will you come back out of it fast enough to then complete the mission and not get shot down or, or not go down and of course they have to have their token woman that gets selected for the final thing but biologically a, a, a woman's um, lungs and heart capacity are simply not the same as as a man's and um, and I was actually told by someone else that the reason why they actually um, one of the arguments for why they allowed women uh, to actually begin taking these combat missions was they decided that um, it would never be the case that they would need to fly a mission like that anymore since we have drones. <laughs> they, well, uh, it's the same thing uh, with uh, a combat, right? Is right. Um, well, we, we just don't we don't have as many soldiers on the ground. We have other right. forms of war. Right. right. Yeah. right. So, Pastor, I got I have to ask you. You know, I've in the last few years I've woken up to the idea that we are absolutely saturated in egalitarian culture. Everywhere around us, even inside the church. And so some of the things that we're saying here are going to hit people's ears really harshly. And especially, I think, a lot of young men, because they they want to consider themselves masculine. They think arguing against you to protect the women that they want to be preachers is being masculine. But for a young man who's hearing this and like, OK, if egalitarianism is everywhere in the culture, how do I start to develop a masculine form of Christianity? Well, it has to start with um, your relationship to the Lord, of course, right? You, I mean, we still all submit to God, so you you have to start there. You have to go to His Word, and um, 
And and so part of being a man as a, as a Christian, well, all men should do this, but is is seeking to obey God. So sanctification should play out somewhat differently for men and women in that mm. a man should should seek to be a godly man and a woman a godly woman. And so those are there's going to be different duties, different uh, characteristics, and um, you know. So I think the Bible like it it, it calls all people to be courageous, but you know, that should play out a little bit differently for a man. I mean, in, in some cases, that's going to be literally fighting, right? I mean, right. have that in the Old Testament. Right. Uh, be strong and courageous, you know, as you go into war. But um, uh, otherwise, it's going to be be, re- be responsible, take up uh, the duties God has placed on you as a man, get a job, you know, work hard in life, and uh, as seek to, to win a woman and um, marry and, and provide for her and, and have children. And, um, and baptize them. And make sure you baptize them. Of course. <laughs> yes, of course. Yes, of course. Yes. I, I remember years ago, I think too, like Christians need to be thoughtful about this with our kids. Like as you're training them up, because we're training them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But even that's not gender neutral. I mean, as we up, right. raise up your boys and your girls, be thinking about uh, these are different kinds of arrows. They're all arrows. They're all to be sharp and they're all to do damage to the enemy. But we want our daughters to grow up um, seeing what they're for. And we want our sons to grow up seeing what, what they're for. I remember right. years ago, one of the times, one of the, the examples that Pastor Doug gave that was a, like really like helpful in, in making, like making this clear to me was he, he said, we need to be careful about this, particularly um, in our Christian schools. And he said, a lot of times our Christian schools, institutions don't tend to be boy friendly. That's right. right? Institutions tend to be color inside the lines, you know, tuck your shirt in and all the rest of it. And it can tend to, if we're not careful, feminize the boys. Mm -hmm. And the girls are all, you know, checking their boxes and getting their straight A's. And the only boys that get like the school awards, for example, are the ones that, you know, are uh, feminine, are kind of feminine, (laughs) you know, and and it's like they, they are acting like all the girls. And he said, we need to be mindful of this and we need to figure out ways to see real masculinity. And and the example he gave is, you know, when you have teenage girls, their piety is going to look differently. Mm -hmm. And and so, you know, maybe it's, you know, a a girlfriend's going through a hard time and they leave a little note in the locker with a Bible verse, I'm thinking about you and praying for you. But that would be weird. Don't leave me one of those. Yeah, yeah, but like you don't don't want to set that up and be like, now boys, if you were really Christian and really godly, you'd be writing little, you know, curly Q Bible verses and putting, you know, no. For your buddy. No, like (laughs) you ought to get detention if you do that. Um, But he said, you know, you might be walking down a hall in a Christian school one day and see one boy um, punch another kid in the face. And and you might say, whoa, whoa, what's going on? And grab him and say, what happened? He says, he asked a non-Christian girl out. And you say, very good. (laughs) <laughs> right response. Did you, did you yeah. learn your lesson? Yeah. You know, I mean, if you say it's never okay to hit, well, no, you're wrong. That's yeah. that's unbiblical. That's that's not yeah. true. And sometimes uh, the way that men communicate is just different. Yeah. And and you sometimes it's a hard word. Sometimes it's a it's a punch. Sometimes it's a grab them by. The, what do you think you're doing? Right. What the heck you think you're doing? Right. And that's how men love one another. That's how iron sharpens iron. And I'm not saying fist fights, you know, is, is the way that, you know, solves everything, but I'm just saying a, a godly a parent, a godly teacher, a godly pastor, if, if those two kids ended up in your, you know, those two boys ended up in your, you know, principal's office and you're a godly principal, you ought to be thinking, you know, there might be some correction to be made, but nevertheless, you're saying good on you. Yeah. Good work. That is godliness in, in a young man. Yeah. Right. Um, calling his friend out for, you know, being interested in a non-Christian girl. Yeah. How much time you got left? I, I got time. You got time. Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. okay. You I heard Zach card? was coming. I was hey, like, can, can I ask a question? After no, it's been end. like it's After been like twenty end. minutes. Don't we have? <laughs> he usually hogs it. Go ahead. Let's speak, let's speak of education, shall we, Pastor? That's the time <laughs> for you to read the ad. You, oh, I'm gonna yes. read the ad. Yeah, okay. you gotta, we got to add. Speaking uh-huh. of education, I see what you did there. Yeah. Uh-huh. Today's culture shifts like sand, but New St. Andrews College. <laughs> <laughs> the cut and paste is hilarious on this because it doesn't make sense. Um, you should go to New St. Andrews College. By the way, I brought my I brought my mug That's in. That's nice. It says New St. Andrews College. You know, and so that's, that's why you, nice. should, you should you should go there. Logic and language, hard work and joyful courage, old books and godly professors. New St. Andrews College provides time tested resources that can equip your student for any vocation and for being men and women who know that's what right. men and women that's right. Are. The guys punch each other in the face. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. sometimes yeah. If need be. If need that'd, be. That'd be fine. It'd be totally fine. <laughs> NSA.edu. Check it out today. All right. You can go with your All question. All right, Gabe, Roger. you have a question? Yeah, yeah. Um, it better be good. So, I'm going to veto if it's not. Um, I went down your Twitter thread, and you seem like a little bit um, out of the normal PCA lane. <laughs> 
of how we're you gonna need some bourbon for this. Your um, <laughs> you can see where it's going. I see what this is going. <laughs> um, and and so I, you know, like I said earlier, I grew up in the PCA in, in the eighties and nineties and two thousands. Um, uh, I end up uh, over the different states. I end up moving here to Moscow in two thousand two. So I, I've been in PCA churches in Texas, uh, New Mexico, Oregon. Um, all members uh, with my family there at those churches. And and my experience with the PCA was the the pastors wouldn't touch politics. Uh, I mean, I don't think I now I know my pastor in Texas would touch politics in the in the um, uh, schoolroom because he he taught at our school, um, and but normally it had to do with North and South, um, you know the the war of Northern aggression kind of kind of kind of <laughs> politics, whoa, whoa. <laughs> you know uh, that kind of thing. But it, it, so over time, it, it seems like the PCA has really disconnected itself from the political process and speaking into politics. But I go down your Twitter thread and I, I see something very different. I see you kind of engaging in the in politics and and talking into politics. In fact, you got um, a PCA pastor in Florida um, banned you from their Twitter thread because you were challenging him on politics recently. Um, how? Uh, I, I guess. Why did you I should bring that up? That was kind yeah, of a sore was... spot. Yeah, no, uh, I, I, don't, I don't like getting blocked, but you know some people do. It's, it's okay. It's okay. I'm just kidding. Um, you know, so I guess kind of two questions here. One is, um, why should pastors be speaking into politics? And then kind of, um, I guess, kind of related to that, uh, why is the PCA um, now things might be changing a little bit? It sounds like you you know some more conservative movements that are going on than I do. Um, but why is the? Let's just start with the first question. Why should pastors be involved in politics and speaking into that? That world. Well, I think um, when we're preaching, you know, we shouldn't we shouldn't get into politics uh, when it's unnecessary, I guess. But uh, p- part of the thing today is we're, we're not debating like tariff rates, right? Yeah, it's not like some some old uh, politics back in the day. Some obscure, tariff. 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 Yeah. some obscure detail. Wait, yeah. but, the, but the Bible speaks to that still, right, right? Right. But 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 I'm I'm thinking when we're preaching to our congregations, I mean, we should educate them, you know, apply the Bible uh, to their lives. Uh, but there, there's so many things in politics today that we, we just have to speak to as the church, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we have to equip our people to live in a world that is hostile towards Christian beliefs, right. especially in the area of sexuality. Um, so I, I think that's part of it is just the way politics have gone today. They've they've become very theological. Uh-huh. Um, and so we, we have to speak to, to things there. You know, on, on Twitter, I think um, social media, I think I'm probably going to maybe address things that I wouldn't address in a, a sermon, uh-huh. just maybe isn't suitable. So, um, you know, some pa- pastors don't want to get into those things. I, I don't want to bind people's consciences, but if, if there's arguments on a certain issue or I think uh, we should be applying the, the Bible in this way, then I, I, I speak to it, whether it's abortion or transgenderism. I mean, you know, there's all these threats we're facing today, and uh, we do want to train our people— our flocks to think biblically about these things. Um, and so that's, that's one reason to talk politics to some extent. It seems like uh, you're also like, even if not everything is suitable for the pulpit, you're going to, you're going to be, a, you're a counselor. Right. Um, people are coming to you for counsel. Um, you're also going to be a Bible study teacher. You're, 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 you have a catechetical how, how to think about the Bible, how to apply it to your circumstances. Yeah, so somebody yeah. might just come and say, pastor, how do, how yeah. should I think about right. Christian yes. nationalism. Right, yeah, right. how should I think about that? Yeah. And so you right. have to have a, a comprehensive theological answer. Right, yeah. right. Or, yeah. So how, or, how it's not just one ahead. verse, or, or, right? Or, be, or at things. least be, even if you don't know the answer right off the top of your tongue, right, or top of your top of your tongue. I did a game. Yeah, top but we all knew what you're saying. That's what. <laughs> There's a top <laughs> of your tongue and the bottom of your tongue and the tip of your tongue, tongue. Yeah, right? yeah, in yeah, the top yeah, of your head. But but even if you don't have the answer, being willing to say, hey. Uh, let me let me look into that with and you. Think about it. Let's let's, let's, let's study you, that. Yeah, to, yeah. I mean, because not every pastor has time to follow all the things. Um, and, and but we we are pastors who are shepherding these souls I, through this world. I'm sorry, guys. That just is, this is hard for me. Why don't we ever talk like this as it relates to the family? What do you mean? We don't ever say, oh, well, you know, we talk about the government. You say, hey, you know, when, why don't you? Pastor, you're a little more confident about talking about the government than most people. Well, nobody ever says that about when they talk about and preach on the family. Everybody expects the pastor yeah, to preach, <laughs> to on, preach the on the preach family. On the family. Yeah. Yeah. You know, everybody expects the pastor to preach on the individual. Yeah. Everybody expects yeah. the pastor to preach but on then when morals it comes to politics, and start righteousness, dancing. right? Yeah. So what part of the government somehow is outside the civil magic? What side is yeah. outside of the, the God's reign? Of course, the Bible, of course, you know, it speaks to both. You have 
Romans 13 on submitting to govern, governing authorities, and then you also have instructions for the for the family. So it's you're right. Politics are definitely not outside the Bible. Well, and what about the Ten Commandments? And the, <laughs> and the book. Those don't apply. Those don't apply to the book, state. Yeah. Book, of, <laughs> book of Deuteronomy. I'm, I'm just saying, like, I'm yeah. sorry. Y'all should, government have no. Does that not apply to the government? Yeah. You should have no other gods but the true God. Yeah. Are we afraid to preach that to our civil magistrate? Yeah. How about don't lie? We, 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 Thou shall not steal. How yeah. about stealing? Yeah, Unless yeah. by majority vote. How yeah. about the Lord's uh-huh. Day? Yeah. Hello. Yeah. I mean, all of a sudden, it's just so funny how that. Yeah. Everybody expects we don't ever have this conversation. You know, I was thinking about Vody Bakum when he talked about this. Vody was saying, when it comes to homosexuality, we kind of pad it. Now, the way the Bible talks about this, I, in case there's any homosexuals here, and, and I would love I, I would, you. Yeah, yeah. Don't worry. I, I know homosexuals, and so we've worked to, <laughs> and we make all these caveats. You know, we, right. the, the whole intent dies the death of a thousand cuts. Right. And we do the exact same thing as when it comes to the civil magistrate. Yeah. No. Right. We have some things to say because you're under the authority of God, so submit and obey or be crushed. That's the same yeah. thing we would say to the sinner. That's the same. Yeah. There's not a government that is a, that's existing that is outside the authority of Scripture. And so it's funny how I think even our own mindsets are like, you're ooh, right. pastor's you're... talking on politics. Ooh. Well, and here's, here's another issue. is It's not just preaching from the pulpit, but the church, I think, has a duty to, to speak to the state and correct it when it gets out of line. Yeah. So and, and so this this ties in. We were talking a little bit about uh, there's an overture before the general assembly. Well, hopefully we'll go uh, through the committee uh, this summer, which would call the state this from the PCA would call the state to ban uh, transgender surgeries on minors. Yeah. Which, I mean, seems like common sense to me. Uh, <laughs> right. I mean, this is harmful, obviously, right. towards minors. Yeah. I mean, I don't think anybody should be having these surgeries. But we're talking about people uh, who we don't allow to yeah. drink alcohol or right. do a variety Bu- of other things. Buy can't, cigarettes. Can't buy cigarettes, but right. hey, you can mutilate your you can body. Cut your junk off. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so uh, this just this seems like if we can't speak to this, what, what are we going to speak to as the church? Right. So, I, wait, I, wait, so tell me about this overture. This overture went forward and— So it's, it's, it's up, a, a pres- I believe a presbytery sent it up uh, to its overture 12. Yep, overture 12, petitioning government to end sex change procedures for minors. What's the presbytery? Does it say? Uh, um, it it? Evangel, Evangel okay. Presbytery. Okay. Yeah, if you want to read some of that uh, at the bottom. But yeah, it's it's petitioning the, the government. Yeah. And and so I don't think we should do this all the time, but there is a place for the church to uh, speak to the state. I mean, we've done it before with abortion. Right. The PCA has. So this is, yeah. this is not I, out of line. I mean, this is stuff we do. The SBC does it like every year about racism. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they repent every year. <laughs> We and want you to know, we still think racism is bad. It's and the really PCA bad. did this about every five years for a while. You know. <laughs> All right, so Pastor, i got to hit you up on Christian nationalism. This is a big topic right now. Oh, yeah, you might want to drink a lot of water. For this <laughs> uh, you know, the conversation is having right now, It's it seems that um, America has lost its Christian identity, and a lot are trying to figure out how to get it back. What is your take on Christian nas- nationalism to nationalism or to not to nationalism? And do you want New Mexico to be Christian? I, I I do want all civil governments to to bow the knee to Christ. So I I think they should certainly be theistic, but I I still think they should recognize the name of Christ. I uh, I don't think I want an established church per se. Um, you know where it's like the Presbyterian state of you know New Mexico or something. But um, yeah, and I I think we should we should want Christian laws uh, reflecting. Uh, you know, God's, God's word. And so I know there's the whole debate about applying the first table of the law to, to the state, but I think some of that's inevitable that you, you know, if you don't have, I mean, you guys talk about this, I think probably if you don't have blasphemy laws, uh, you're going to have some anti-Christian blasphemy laws. Yeah, right? Right, right, so right. we're kind of seeing that today. Um, yeah. So I, I think some of that's inevitable. You're really playing it safe right now. <laughs> so you want me to call myself a Christian nationalist? I'm just trying to figure out, you know. I, it, I, I don't really have a problem with the, the term as long as it's understood. I mean, some people, I guess, define it in a bad way. And so, mm. then, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm i reading uh, Stephen Wolf's book. I haven't finished it yet, but it's. <laughs> I, I was asked, I'll tell you guys, I was asked to preach in Texas. On Christian nationalism, I, I, really? I actually, yeah, I had there was like there was the request. The ch- there's, there's a church that actually funny. had me preach over spring break, and and they said we'd like you to preach on Christian nationalism. I was like, wow, that's kind of specific. And <laughs> we're going <laughs> like, okay, we're going there. And uh, 
So I, I, I just opened up by, I, well, first oh, of all. Oh, you already did it? I did it. It was already done. Oh, I want to hear this I, one. I, I, I appreciate it. But I, I said, I said, this is the first time I've ever been asked to preach on Christian nationalism, so it might be my last time. And uh, and, then, and then I said, basically, if you're talking about Buffalo Head Man, you know, yeah. uh, Tumnus on January 6th yeah. in the, in the, in the court, you know, in the, in the Congress, January 6th, congressional yeah, yeah. quarters, then no, count me out. I'm not, I'm not Buffalo head man, even, even notwithstanding Tucker Carlson's attempt to rehabilitate him to some extent. <laughs> uh, and, but if we're talking about uh, discipling the nations, teaching them to obey everything that Jesus Christ commanded, then absolutely I am. Yeah. Right. You know, great commission, yeah. Like, yeah. which is something that every Bible Christian thought until about five minutes ago. Yeah. Like every Bible Christian pretty much outside of like Anabaptists and extreme like Two kingdom people. Here, here's another thing. How about how about Sabbath laws? I mean, even when the states got rid of state churches, so they disestablished. Yeah. You st- Still all Christians, laws. all Christians supported yeah. Sabbath laws. This right. wasn't just Presbyterian. Right. So, yeah. um, and those have been lost, and now I, I think that's certainly tied with really the uh, d- dismissal of the Sabbath. E- even in reform circles, we really don't honor right. the Lord's mm-hmm. Day. Right, yeah. People missing church, but also. Playing sports on formal yeah. sports and things on yeah. Sundays. Right. I mean, this is just yeah. I'm going going there. Yeah, uh, this yeah. is a huge problem today. Christian nationalist, yeah. right here, guys. So <laughs> maybe, maybe this will get you in more trouble. Are you going to vote DeSantis or Trump? Who do you want up there? Just wondering, past. I, I mean, I think I probably well, DeSantis is obviously going to be more qualified as far as uh, ethics and morality, right? So there's that there. Um, He's also doing a great job as governor of Florida. So, I mean, if I'm in Florida, I don't want him to run for president. Right. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. Yep. We've, um, we've talked about that. Yeah. So, I mean, at some point, I, I think he'd probably be a, a really good president. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I have mixed feelings about Trump, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> I do. I, did you guys see the interview with Tucker Carlson and Trump? And Trump, uh, yeah. on, I, I saw that it happened, but I haven't watched yeah, it. Yeah, I mean— Trump just frustrates me. Frustrates me. Yeah. Frustra- frustrates me. yeah, say it the right way. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> um, is he still championing the the vaccine? Yeah, he's not changing that position. He is going to change. No, he's not changing. He's, yeah. he's going to hold on. So to I don't it. know. He so, didn't. He didn't. So, he didn't bring that up. So in the here's the, like here's the weird part because you know you know uh, Robert Kennedy is running on, on the Democratic ticket. Yeah, and, and man, he's got my ear. And, like and like the, you know? not mine. The, dude, the dude's like. Old, Did you hear his talk at Hillsdale? The dude's no. like. Basically, old school liberal. Yeah, like, he's, yep. he's, like I mean, and, which is virtually indistinguishable from uh, most Republicans, by the way. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, right. He, he just he, he's John McCain. He, yeah, probably. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, but but who, who no, a bunch no, of people have voted no. For. I, but I would say probably better, better, better yes, than John yes. McCain. I think he's further right on being like he's on freedom, on freedom, like, freedom of yeah, religion, actually, freedom like, of vaccine. He's talking freedom, about yeah. like getting the government out of our lives. He hates the vaccine. He hates the the Pfizer corruption, the Fauci corruption. His talk at Hillsdale like, was pretty amazing. He, like, he, so he can he, see the sun. Like he's more like <laughs> he's more libertarian <laughs> than, okay. than most of our politicians, yep, yep. which would be a hilarious. You know, I mean, I know. if you end up with like Trump and Kennedy, for example. Yeah. I mean, how's he going to get through the Democratic primary? I, 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 no I, I, it doesn't, doesn't seem like it's likely, but um, no, so, he has more of a chance of getting through the Republican primary than, than the Democratic primary. <laughs> he does. No, hundred percent. Yeah. He does. So, yeah. Pastor, here's here's my last question for you, and we'll let you go because I'm not, not going to hold you hostage since you don't really engage with my questions. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think you got some deeper thoughts. I see him running around in your head, and I'm like, I know he was really a lawyer. To, that's right. He's a lawyer. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Never mind. I got it. I got it. Now, if he was prosecuting me, I'd be yeah, all over the place. You'd be in trouble. Yeah. Um, so. What are the fights that you're looking at right now that you're like, I want that one? Mm. Like politically or in the church? Yes. <laughs> politically. Oh. You can get me oh, both of them. Oh. Any of them. Which one are you arm for bear on? Well, I, I think we definitely got to go after this transgender, transgender stuff. Um, I, I think it's it, it's just, it's tied with the feminism, but it's like the worst outcome, right? And, and training kids in this stuff, I, I just think it's... It's going to cause a lot of problems. It already is. So yeah. I think we need to target that, and I don't think we should shy away. So something like this overture, I think we should be fully behind. Obviously, I'm very much opposed to abortion. I think we should go yeah. hard after that. We should criminalize it. I've right. written on that some. Yeah. Yeah. So. I got. Well, I mean, this is maybe this is a bomb. I don't. What's that? Try to drop bomb. You can drop I mean, a bomb. What's the bomb? Well, well it, bomb. you can drop it, I mean, and then if we don't like it, you can get the music. Go. We can. Yeah. 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 Well, let's see what's your bomb. You ready? I mean, like, do you think there's a connection between like? Baptist, Presbyterian. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
and Presbyterians. I included Presbyterians in that. Yeah, I'm and sure And the you current did. transgender movement. Backstage. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks for coming on the show. Yeah. Yeah. We're not gonna get you next nope, time. No that's comment. Our, that's, our smoke. that's our smoke. If you're single, get married. If you're married, have you some kids? If you have kids, go baptize them. Until go Monday, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Go fight, laugh, and feast. This is Cross Politics. No show tomorrow. A lot of parents are waking up to the problems of the current American educational system. And when the Department of Education can't determine what a boy is or what a girl is, why in the world would any sane parent trust them with a math curriculum? We are regular Christian parents who found ourselves with children to educate. And we found that the options available usually fell into two categories. Either the education was, was good, but was lacking in the Christian department, or the Christian part was solid and the education was lacking. So we got a group of parents together and said, why not? Let's start classical Christian school. When I was first approached with doing the school, being a teacher as well as having my son be a student, I, I wasn't looking for anything different. And this came along and it has been just such an answer to prayer of, of little things that we didn't realize that the school would then give to our son that we didn't know we were needing. And uh, there were just a lot of uh, benefits to coming to school, the programs that people could offer, um, some of the areas where I'm not the strongest in, some teachers were able to do it. And then they asked if I would be interested in helping to teach, and I jumped on board. I began very skeptical, if I'm being honest. There have been a few days where, especially in the beginning, I wondered if I made the right choice. But it is the relationship and the fellowship that is fostered here that has taken away any of my hesitation or my fears. If you're trying to decide, is school right for my child? Is staying home? And, you know, I, I like that this kind of gives you a feel of both of those things. Like, I still feel in charge and in control of my son's education. Um, but I also know that maybe science is not the best thing that I can teach him. His science teacher comes in and can just help take that load from me and be able to help him. And it's, it's been great. Uh, we want to be the tool to help you achieve what we believe is the most important job in the world, training up your children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. They may be future pastors. They may be future politicians. They may just be a dad. They may be a mom. We don't know what the Lord's called them to. And the fact that I get the honor of being able to be a part of that journey and their education. It feels perfect for right now because I'm watching my son love to learn. And I get that it feels like a risk to step out of what society says is normal because the normal thing is you put your kindergartner in school five days a week, eight to three, every day for the rest of their lives. And that's what you're supposed to do. But then you end up with an 18 year old that you barely know who hates every bit of school, who barely knows what they want to do with their future. And to be able to be a part of this, it's like I'm watching a dream that I didn't even really know was a dream kind of unfold. Our students love being here. Our teachers are excited. They are committed and they are here for the long haul. They're here because they believe in the mission. You have to decide what's most important to you. And what was most important to me is surrounding myself and my son with like-minded people who were ready to go to battle because that's what we're doing. For them.